So today obviously is a continuity um, community on adjusting assessments. Uh, and I'd like to think through some of the questions that may be floating through your mind right now. Uh, the Porvoo Center has been getting many questions about addressing assessment. And so that's part of what prompted us to run today's session. So these are some of the questions that may be on people's minds. It's certainly some of the ones that we have heard um, and hopefully not the ones that are keeping you up at night, but that may be the case. So that's why we're here. Uh, so out of all the things that you could be asking yourself, I'm really interested in what brought you here today to take the hour to be a part of this conversation. So if you could point in the chat window, if you could just state what you really, what why, why did you come? What are you hoping to get from this? Uh, maybe what challenge are you really facing in this moment? Overview, yeah. Sam, I see that. So part of what I'm hoping, and we'll talk about this, is really to give an opportunity for people to share about what has been uh, happening that they've been successful in uh, adjusting. So that's actually what I think a main goal of this continuity of community series really is. Yep. Adapting from exams and multiple choice. Yes. So I think we've reached a stage, I'm, I'm looking at the comment here from um, Kira about students who have tested positive at this point and what that means and how do we support people who are really not uh, thinking assessment is necessarily the highest thing on their radar. Defining open book exams, yes. Yeah, Josh, I see that. So, right. Um, under ideal circumstances, we're going to talk about that. So what would instructors, what would they be doing under ideal circumstances? That's actually a question I'm going to be asking you. And then we will discuss how to adjust given less than ideal <laughs> circumstances. Thank you. So if anyone else wants to chime in, feel free. Uh, I'm going to move forward just to, to keep us rolling. So my objectives, my, my goals for today are really by the end of this session to allow you to discuss approaches for adapting assessment to the online learning environment to problem solve uh, with Corvu staff as well as each other about the complex uh, assessment challenges that we're facing in not just moving online, but moving online mid-semester in, in a world of um, possible stress for students as well as yourselves. Uh, and learning about resources available through uh, Yale, as uh, Corvu Center, as well as Yale more broadly. All right, poll time. So let me uh, launch my poll here, I believe that you will be able to see it in a second. All right, so I believe you can see it. So the question is, how much do you anticipate needing to modify your current assessments? So I'm interested if you could just see where you are right now. I'm not expecting anyone to put none at all. Otherwise, I'm not quite sure why you're here, but I would love to hear your insights. <laughs> none at all. Oh, yay. OK, awesome. I like that somebody did that. Please let me know what you have done to, to get you to that point a great deal moderately. Okay. About half of the people have voted, so I'm gonna give just another minute for those who would like to vote uh, to go ahead and do that, or not vote, but rather submit your response. No one wins in this, no, no competition. All right, we're gonna we're gonna keep it there. I think there might be others who might want to do this, but um, so about half of the people have said that they really. Uh, I'll just share it so that you can see it as well. Um, a great deal. People are anticipating um, really needing at, at least a moderate amount of help. Um, some people maybe not at all, or, or a little. Um, so that's what we. I just want to get a sense of the room <laughs> where people are and what they're thinking. I'm I'm pleasantly surprised no one said ah send help. I was hoping that would be the case, but you never know. Uh, so thank you. Um, so now that we have a sense of where you are, I want to just acknowledge the fact that this isn't Plan A, right? So this isn't necessarily where we thought we'd be um, at this time, and I I want to just acknowledge that. Uh, uh, 
to really think about the fact that this is not necessarily where we would have started. If we had planned to be online and do assessments online, we may have done things differently than what we might do right now. And so I think many of us wanted, hopefully all of us really wanna do well at whatever we're doing for our students, for ourselves, for our professional career. Um, and this is a challenge. And I just wanna acknowledge that in the room and make sure that you acknowledge that for yourselves and give yourself a little grace um, during this time. Uh, so, I want to frame this as a solvable opportunity. Uh, we'll get through this. <laughs> Assessments will happen. Students will, will you know, continue on in the semester. And I, I want to see this also as an opportunity for you to think about what you may do right now that you may not do otherwise in a way to help have these conversations about assessment and think about how you can pivot um, and do something useful for your students and yourself, given the context that you're in. So reasonable steps. <laughs> I'm going to say it a couple times. I, I want you to think about what is appropriate, not just if you were doing the perfect online class, but given right now where we are, what is a reasonable step to ask of yourselves and to ask of your students? So I'm going to do another poll here and I'm going to ask you, and hang on a minute. I'm going to ask you to hang on a minute. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to know what you're adjusting from. So this is really the, the question of ideal <laughs> uh, assessments. If you were in your classroom and things were running as you expected, what were you intending to do is really another way to ask this. I'm gonna share just so you can see. So most people are doing some type of um, exams or quizzes, whether that's multiple choice only or a mix of different things. And I see Sam's doing P sets and drawing graphs, which is a whole other conversation we can have about how to do that um, and how people have been addressing that. Uh, so a few people are doing essays and writing, performances and presentation, project-based work. And again, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You may be doing a bit of all of them. All right, so thank you. That gives us a good sense of, of where people are coming from um, and some of the ways in which we could think about diving into some strategies that come from these different uh, assessments. Okay, and Sydney, thank you. I see, I see that you're talking about um, the lab, physics lab, yes. Okay, so. Did I share the results? I thought I did, maybe I did not. So, here we go. All right. Let me move my, my polling. Okay, great. So this is not uh, surprising to me. Uh, in the faculty that we work with, mostly exams and quizzes are, are um, the kind of the, the staple of assessments, essays and writings and presentations. Today, I wanna to kind of back up a little bit and think about the plethora of ways that we could think about assessment and the different tools that allow us to adapt these in different ways for the context in which we teach, whether that's a good degree of peer um, interactions and collaborations, or whether that's really thinking about students' own trajectory of learning or a project-based course. Um, the, these can be adapted in a variety of ways, and that's what I hope we're gonna discuss a little in more detail today. Regardless of what you pick, the question that I really want us to think about is what's best to pick? So rather than thinking about what tool you wanna to use, why would you wanna use that kind of assessment is really the question that I hope you ask. So I'd like to think about approaching assessment in, in kind of three ideas, main ideas to keep in mind. One is to think about what your goals are. What specific knowledge or skills do you hope students to have at the end of this semester or at the end of a um, segment of the course even? And if you haven't articulated these, to think about, boil down, what is the thing you want students to walk away with? Uh, that's really what we want to think about assessing. Did they get there? Did they meet the expectation that you hoped that they would get in participating in your course this semester? I also want to acknowledge the fact that this may have changed. Um, perhaps you were thinking about getting them to X, Y, Z. If you have um, enough autonomy in, in your course to to make some big adjustments, that might be something you wanna do depending on your student circumstances and the content of your course. I also want to encourage you to consider alternatives. So um, 
I think that's why you're here. <laughs> so I don't think that's shocking, but I think what I want you to uh, think about is not just what you could do, but what you could do that would allow students to demonstrate their knowledge in a way that meets what you hope to assess. And so that might look different in online learning than it may look in your courses. And it may look different than what you anticipated and what students anticipated. And that can be a level of anxiety for both you and your students. So um, being as clear as possible is crucial here. Uh, students are getting uh, an influx of emails, as I'm sure you are as well, as well as dealing with all kinds of family travel issues and challenges. And so really articulating not just what you expect of them, but what you expect of them in order to help them be successful. What do they need to do and when? It's really their question right now and keeping it simple um, and simple as clear. <laughs> so uh, clear and simple communication is uh, pivotal. So regardless of what you pick and regardless of how you change, these are the three things I really hope that you keep in mind. And so my background, I'm a cognitive psychologist and I could not not say anything about this. Uh, we are going to be running a continuity community on um, student motivation next week. And so we'll come back with the ideas, these ideas. But specifically in uh, relationship to assessment, I encourage you to think about what is really happening right now to your students and yourselves. Uh, what will students remember and feel when they look back about this experience? It may not be every single detail that you hope they learn during the semester. But the way in which you convey this information, the way in which you ask them to demonstrate this information will lend to an ease of their anxiety potentially or a heightened <laughs> sense of anxiety and really how they recall this experience. So just keep that in mind. Um, what's important to your students right now? What's important to you right now? Um, how can we engage students intellectually regardless of how they do on an assessment? It's something that they may actually want right now. Um, to, to have some kind of sense of um, support and, and normal uh, ongoing academic affairs. So I, I, I encourage us to think about what our responsibility is as educators in this context and how we can best support our students. And right now, I think that we could actually um, flip some of the wording here and not just ask what will your students remember and feel, but what will you remember and feel from this time? What is important to you? right now. Um, so when we talk about taking reasonable steps in assessment, think about what your own capacity is, what your TS capacity are, um, what your students capacity is. So kind of thinking about all of these different stakeholders in your course and what is reasonable to ask of yourself and them. Uh, so that's what we're hoping to discuss today in more depth. So I'm going to go through these three big areas, um, exams and quizzes, um, presentations and essays and written work and think about some tweaks. So I, I have some ideas of what um, I would I would generally um, not necessarily advocate for, for but suggest people consider on the slide here and I'll go through them a, a little bit. But what I would like to then do, I'll pause on this slide and ask people who are doing quizzes and exams what they have found helpful or what they're really stuck on right now. Um, so one thing that you can do with exams and quizzes is really just to carry on <laughs> with some um, exams through Canvas. So you can um, open things up to uh, students individually on Canvas. You can open up quizzes for a set amount of time. You can give them a fixed duration of how long they have to complete something. So you can take what you have and essentially distribute it on Canvas. So that would be kind of a, a simple, no, almost no change solution. Um, that's probably not the case for many of the things that we're doing. So uh, another approach is, is uh, a common one that we've been hearing is to really take the exams and open it up. You can't necessarily say that students aren't going to at least have access to things that will provide them additional resources to complete um, assessments. So given that, how can you help students utilize that in a way that helps them retain and learn the information? So it really comes down to student learning. Yes, and each other, yes. <laughs> so they can share with each other, they can share, they can look at their um, resources, all of that um, is, is open. There are tools to constrain um, what students can access during taking a quiz, um, which is possible. If you do that, I, I would encourage you to think about some of the limitations that that can have about uh, students' broad access to some of the um, uh, software that they may actually need 
to open in order to answer uh, your quizzes and tests. So just keep that in mind as you, as you think about that. Um, the other thing that we could do is make some adjustments that are not completely redoing what you uh, planned, but maybe adapting it a bit. And this is where I think the work comes in and uh, how we can be really thoughtful and strategic about what we change and why. So part of what we've been hearing is a concern around um, academic integrity. So if students can use resources and can Google and can use each other and can look up answers, how can we help students to really engage in the kind of learning that we want them to and hope that they would engage in, that they would be doing in the classroom? Uh, and what I would, what I would the, the big message, one big message I would hope that you take away from this is really to think about the opportunity to ask for increased logic from students. So when you ask them about why they came to some conclusion or ask them to explain their thinking, that's much harder to Google and replicate. <laughs> so the more, the more uh, you ask them to kind of draw from within their own thinking, the more information you're going to get from them about their own logic and thinking, right? So there are, of course, uh, difficulties to that. If you have a very large course and you're looking for really something that is multiple choice test and you don't want to do a lot of open ending ended rubric coding, I hear you. <laughs> um, there's a couple ways that, that uh, you can think about adapting multiple choice answers in a way that asks student for, students for some of that logic. Uh, and I can share some examples of these in a bit. Uh, another way to do that is to think about giving opportunities for revision. So if people get a wrong answer, giving them the opportunity to, to revise. And this does a few things. This actually eases the burden of, of the anxiety that students may be feeling and allows them to learn the content again, right? To give them the opportunity to review. And if you pair that potentially with um, their own explanations about why they got what they did why they got an answer wrong and how they fix it, you're now deepening their, their um, knowledge in a way that we hope will uh, produce better learning. Uh, you can also uh, utilize students by having them generate questions. And I like this approach. If you, it's, it's, it may work in a, um, maybe a moderate to small size class, depending on how many TFs you have or, or the uh, format of your course, but students can generate their own questions and explain to you what the answers are and why they ask this. Why is this concept important to know? What is the right answer? Why is it right? What are the distractors? Why are they, why are they wrong? Um, so giving students an opportunity to really dig into the content. And if that's the case, that also, also can decrease the um, opportunity for, for um, sharing answers where they shouldn't, right? Uh, so that's another uh, thing to think about. Uh, you could also completely change what you're doing and think instead of exams or quizzes, thinking more about an annotated portfolio, for example. Um, so you could take what students have already done and instead of a final, for example, I'm not advocating that this will work in every context, but um, instead of a final, have them put together their previous work and explain their thinking over the course of the semester. How has it changed? What were the concepts that they in particular struggled with? and how did they or could they improve their learning in that content. And so this is really reinforcing what they have already learned. Um, so that's another option. And it gives them a lot of um, reflective practice and metacognition around both what they've done in this course, but then learning more broadly for themselves. So I'm gonna pause here um, and ask if there are questions about exams and quizzes, which I'm sure there are, as well as if people have uh, really come up with any clever ideas or even an idea that you're not sure is clever that you would like to share to see if it helps others. I encourage you to do that in the chat now, um, as well as I can give you the opportunity, I believe, um, to share your screen if you would like to, or um, to speak rather, if you would like to do that. Yes, um, so I, Sydney, I see um, uh, your question. Oh, I see people. Oh, Sydney's raising her hand. I would love to know. Okay, hang on one moment. I'll let you uh, share the stage here. I, I don't need. I don't need to share my screen. Uh, but I would ask: Do you know whether final exams are going to be scheduled for particular times as they would be in the past? That is a great question. And, and then, and then, uh, the physics 
166 and physics 205, well, I guess it would just be the 166, would ordinarily take place over five days and several sessions because they have to have access to equipment, which of course we no longer have. Mm -hmm. And so the question would be, is that something that, that the university would expect to be given for a one three hour period, which would make it more difficult to share answers, also known in another way as cheating. Uh, and uh, Professor Bonnie Fleming is in charge of the course. I'm one of the instructors, but I'm trying to think about how we could make it as close to uh, being there as possible. Uh, and whether it does make sense to do that. I like your idea about the trying to have more reflective answers in addition to, well, can you fit the curve properly and extract useful information out of it? All right, that's, that's it for my diatribe. No, it's great. So re real questions, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, the, the quick answer that I can give is I'm not sure as far as um, what the schedule of final exams are. Um, there's a few poor boo people here. If you know anything concrete, please feel free to chime in or raise your hand. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge that I don't know the answers for the schedules. And so that is something that I can, I can ask others and look up a little more detail on, because I think that is going to be a big question that we're going to ask, be asked um, pretty soon. So uh, I will check and get back to you as I can. Um, on the other side, so um, thank you, Pilar. I see that you're gonna follow up on the question, thank you. So to think about more about what you will actually have them do, I think that's something that would be helpful to think about in conjunction with that answer. So what I would say that you could do regardless of, of the format is to really think about if nothing else, I want students to walk away with knowledge of XYZ or being able to do XYZ. Um, so if you can come up with really what are the, the real nuggets that you want them to walk away with knowing, being able to do, and then depending on the structure that you're given or asked to be to consider, thinking about the best method. So rather than thinking about the method, really backing up and thinking about, well, backwards design, right? Like what are, what are the things I want students to be able to do? Um, and then you can work in the method depending on the, the context is, is a quick answer. I would say the, the longer answer is for you and I to talk about what exactly you want them to ask. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with that too, because I know that that is a light answer to a very nuanced challenge. Um, so I see a couple other comments. That I just want to uh, acknowledge here. Um, exams identical in form with all different values. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple ways that you can look at um, academic integrity, not cheating. <laughs> Sydney, I like that you called it what it is. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that um, you can do that. You can, you can make it so that, you know, the right answer is A and not C and, and all of that. You can also change the wording so that it's, they have to read it carefully. So in some cases it would be, you know, what is, what is the maximum value that XYZ could be versus what is the minimum value? So if you, if you make those changes, it makes it a little harder for, for students to um, uh, swap answers as well as timing. So if you allow them a given amount of time to complete something, um, it makes it harder for them to spend the time garnering resources, right? So that's another way to do it. I will caution that that is more anxiety producing for students um, to really you know, have to do it in a set amount of time, particularly given some difficulty in connecting um, through internet shortages or, or you know, what, whatever the struggles are with students in different areas. Uh, so I would keep that in mind. Ah, Sydney, I see, I see your, uh, your um, setup here. Yes. I'm wondering. I have, th I have thoughts on maybe how to do that through questions, maybe through videos. Um, yeah, let me think on that. I do want to look at other people's comments here too. Um, so Jonathan, I see that uh, you are talking about exams and quizzes on Canvas and that scores weren't different from doing assessments in class um, and that you're trying to figure out how to grade 300 final projects, ideas for peer review and grading. Okay, so I have a couple ideas. I wanna open it up to, to other people if they would like to answer that first. And Sydney, I see your hand and I'm just gonna um, talk about this question and then I will get back to you unless you wanna jump in on this, you're welcome to. Okay, no, he passes. <laughs> Mm 
no takers at the moment. All right, I can I can chime in on some possible ideas for peer review and grading. So, uh, in the in in writing assignments, um, there are some tools that that can auto distribute. Um, oh, Canvas, I believe too, can auto and Polar. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you're if you're uh, on, honest and listening right now, um, ah, Polar can speak specifically to how Canvas can do this. So I'll have her do that in a moment. But I will say that there are resources to, to um, uh, distribute uh, work. What I would say is um, to really consider rubrics importantly in this, to really think about if you're going to ask students to peer review, they really wanna know that their grade is going to be um, not random on, on the uh, kind of perception of their peers who are not experts. So when I've done this in courses and I've had peer reviews, uh, students peer review each other's work and provide a grade for it, for that work, their eyes kind of open and they panic. So I would say that if you choose to do this, to be really clear about the process and about how you as the instructor will intervene when necessary or review kind of the, the scope of what people are saying. So I'm going to uh, Say, Pilar, if you have something that you can speak to directly about how Canvas can do this, I would love to hear that. Sure, of course. So I, I put an item in the chat um, that shares uh, our, harp, our help articles that deal with um, how to implement sort of peer assessments in Canvas. Um, it is something that you can um, that we are, we're happy to sort of set up with you. I know it may not be as transparent when you walk through it on your own for the first time. But if this is something that is interesting to you, um, Megan already touched upon rubrics. It is important to help support however you wish to sort of set this up in Canvas so that your students know what they are um, peer reviewing. But you can set it up in such a way that you have your students um, have to review one, two, or three other people's assignments um, as well. It is leveraging the assignment tool um, and not the quiz tool. So there is a, an element of um, sort of making your choice in terms of how you actually want to um, implement your your assessment um, but this is definitely something that canvas can support and we're happy to um, help you sort of take a look at the assessment that you're trying to, to adapt to bring into canvas and help you make that work thank you yeah depending if it's if and so jonathan can i can i ask if this is um presentation based or is this all content that they could submit um um, uh, yeah, so um, it's actually so it's sort of a final written project, which is uh, they're usually kind of 10 to 15 pages. It's a huge amount of like kind of R coding. It's also a lot of then kind of graphs and discussions. So, I mean, uh, and to theoretically, students can work in groups. So, I mean, we'll meet with like 200 projects. One of the problems that I run into is because I have sort of almost all the who we're doing my grading are actually ULAs, and at least right now, the way the rules work is as soon as we hit the last day of, of sort of classes, um, they're actually not allowed to do any more grading. And so uh, in the past, it's sort of been myself and a couple of TAs and sort of to like actually do justice to, you know, uh, you know what amounts to sort of 200 projects that are 15 to 20 pages a piece. I, I was like, uh, this is not gonna work. So I've been trying to think about a way, partly just to get the students to think more about themselves, like how, like to go through that process of like by grading somebody else's work, how that changes their own understanding of what they've turned in, their own understanding of the material. Um, this looks really cool, actually. I mean, so far I've been using Gradescope for all the homework assignments, which has been great from a sort of like, um, it's done away with the whole problem of TAs doing kind of unequal grading because everyone can sort of see, oh, these are like the, here's the pool of things that can go wrong. And that's actually been hugely helpful in kind of um, the ULAs and the TAs doing the grading. but um, so that's why I've been sort of thinking about like, or even it, that it might be a combination of like uh, three students plus maybe a ULA. I don't know. I'm not quite sure how that would work. Um, but so that the, you know, the, um, that students, that it, it would just to force students themselves to sort of um, think about how they do evaluation, think about how they talk about statistics, but also to get to see the kind of breadth of what other people are doing. Um, so anyway, this assessment tool, um, you know, for looking, sharing, uh, looks great. And so it seems like, I mean, thinking just quickly through it, it seems like, okay, instead of using grade scope for this, we'll just use like kind of set it up as an assignment with a set rubric inside of Canvas, which would totally work out fine. So um, anyway, that's actually sounds quite interesting. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And we're happy to follow up and talk about details too. Great. 
and shout out to GradeScope, which I which I love. So GradeScope allows Great. you to really, um, for, for people who don't know, the two things that I love about it, it's a tool that is, um, I believe it's a plug into Canvas and it allows yeah. you to um, do a few things, but one is to really, uh, I see Pilar looking, she, she knows what to, what to say probably better than I do, but what I love about it, I can say, is that it allows you to code um, short answers much more easily than if you were just doing it by hand. It allows you to go back and if you decide kind of mid, mid uh, grading that, you know what, I really wanna give two points for this, not four, you can go back and auto code all the ones you've already done. It really helps uh, your time. <laughs> and it also helps for consistency among TAs and TFs and, and ULAs who are doing a lot of the grading um, where there may be inconsistencies. And so Pilar, if you wanna say anything more, I'm happy to, happy to do that. I am only, only to confirm what you've said and I am sure faculty who've used it as well. What I'd love to follow up on and I do not believe you can create a peer reviewed grade scope assignment, which would be something I'm going to take a look into after after this call. Um, because in many ways grade scope is superior to, to how canvas would be able to grade, but you'd be missing that peer piece like you wouldn't be able to have your students um, potentially uh, take a look at other people's responses through a grade scope assignment as opposed to a, a canvas assignment. Um, so I'll take a I'll follow up on that one. But grade scope, I'm so glad people are using it. And it's, um, it can be a wonderful tool here. Mm -hmm. And I also I, I hear a little bit in what you were saying, Jonathan, about maybe some, I don't know if this is a new objective, but maybe thinking about more about what it would mean for students to do evaluation and in the, in the um, what they would gain from that. And so thinking about that as maybe an outcome and maybe that is weighed differently depending on the scope of what they do review. And so this is, might be an example in which um, new opportunities could arise based on, based on this. And so I don't wanna speak for you, but it's just something that I heard a little bit. So if others may be in that similar situation where they say, you know what, really this is an opportunity to focus on this. Um, I just wanted to raise it. And so Sydney, did you have a, a question? I saw your hand up earlier. Um, so I'm going to, I asked it via chat. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so I want to think a little bit about essays and writing, which we actually already, um, talked a bit about. So in some cases you might be able to do what you have been doing to really just upload through canvas and, and really what you're, you, what you might be missing is more of that in-person feedback, uh, that might exist. And so I would consider, um, you know, different zoom and different forms of uh, zoom and different forms of feedback. Uh, as students prepare drafts. Um, so we can talk more about that. You can also think about whether um, topics might need to change. And so in some cases, I know people are having trouble accessing the materials that they might need to um, write about their particular topic that they were planning on doing. And so this has happened in a couple of the um, uh, humanities courses where people don't have direct access to the materials they need. So if that's the case, um, again, uh, framing this as an opportunity, you could think about this as, as a way for people to really think about um, having some autonomy in their choice, uh, or autonomy in their um, topics right now, potentially, if, if adjustments need to be made. Um, and I will say that uh, providing students with some autonomy does help them uh, really have some sense of control over, over a situation where in this case, there's not much that they, they have control over. Uh, so think about that as well. Uh, different formats or different deliverables, again, might be helpful here, depending if, if uh, you wanna make those changes. So we talked a bit about this, but if anybody wants to join uh, the chat about essays and writing specifically, um, happy to take those questions as well. I'm gonna keep going, but please, please uh, chime in. I would like to also just think about presentations for a minute. Um, I know that this is a challenge for people who uh, worked in final presentations and group work specifically to their grade. Um, so I wanna ask the question, really, if you, if you wanna do a presentation, I would encourage you to think about whether that's really part of your goal for student learning or whether that was just a great thing to be able to do in the class together. <laughs> um, if students, if you're really looking for students experience um, to be about the content and about their reflection of the content, and presentation wasn't necessarily a main objective of your work, think about whether you need to do it, given that students vary in their, um, 
ability to access internet speeds that will allow them to give presentations. So um, Sydney, I agree, live presentation is critical. <laughs> and so that's why, and so that in that case, it might be an objective, right? If this is something that you really want them to be able to do, how would they carry this out? Like we're all having to do in this context. So I would encourage you to think about recording, think about um, Zoom recording, think about small group presentations where people maybe from the same time zone can, can participate together. Um, and think about whether it is about presenting or about communicating the content that you're really after. So if it's about communication, if you want to review the people's projects rather than have them formally present, that's another option. So just thinking about what might work for your content. Um, and Pilar, thank you for following up. So Gradescope does not have peer reviewed assignments yet. So that's a limitation of Gradescope, but again, Canvas allows some uh, peer review. So we can carry forward with that if you would like. So I want to pause here and, and ask if there are other things that people really want to think about right now. I want to open up the chat, not just to presentations, but more broadly. If there's something on your mind that you would like to kind of group think about, please provide that in the chat and I'll, I'll raise it to the group and we can see if we can um, problem solve together for the next few minutes before we wrap up. And uh, I'll follow up with some um, next steps and resources as well. But for now, I'd like to open it up. Pilar is noting that Panopto um, in the media library can be used to store video assignments um, from students as well. So that's another issue. Yeah, so I can follow up. I, there was um, a bit of research done on peer review grading that um, came out of writing, a peer review of writing, which other, uh, this is college writing submissions, mostly in um, social science, I believe. And it showed that students' ratings, when you have, I believe, five to seven novice <laughs> um, graders, when you average that number together, it, it starts to approximate expert level feedback. <laughs> so you can keep that in mind. I don't know what that's worth, or if you want to ask five to seven of, of uh, um, uh, for every person to, to, to look at five to seven papers seems a little excessive to me right now, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, when I do peer review work, I do show them that data and talk to them about what it means to peer review and what the purpose of it is and, ha and how I will be sure as the instructor not to overweight what I know is someone who is learning this content, not to overweight their grade in a way that could disproportionately um, negatively impact someone inappropriately, right? So um, that is something that, that I would encourage you to be clear about how you will provide oversight. Ah, <laughs> a high mind question from Sydney. How well have the online classes been going? Yes, I will, I will leave that to the, to the people doing most of the teaching right now. No takers, Sydney. <laughs> ah. I guess I'll just say that um, it, it's been interesting because so I've been using um, kind of Panopto to do classroom capture for um, both of the kind of big stack classes that I teach. So it's about 600 students between two classes right now. And as it was, 80% of students were pretty much already watching the online videos. So um, uh, it's um, most people's experience hasn't really changed much. It's been interesting to see a lot in terms of students' facility with Zoom, um, and um, uh, and so that's its own kind of I don't know. It's like kind of um, social teaching as for the people who have lots of experience versus the students who show up who like they don't know where the buttons are and they're not quite sure what to do. Um, one thing I've certainly found with I think I have 30 TAs something like that. It's just hard to like pin them down across all the time zones. And so I think that's been one of my biggest challenges is actually sort of finding a time to really kind of make sure that they're um, kind of on the ball uh, doing things. One thing I, uh, I sort of felt like I just need a little humor here. So I had my daughter who loves to do musical theater and just like stupid like TikTok videos. So I've been sticking like a two minute TikTok or whatever stupid video of hers at the end of all of the online videos. 
one thing that's been really fun to kind of mess around with is to kind of think, think about. So I'm, uh, I, I figured I was going to sort of put up like three different kind of formats of videos for students to watch. So one of them is I just grabbed a video that I had from last year because the material didn't really change that much. So sort of using a Panopto canvas like in the classroom capture from last year. And then um, sort of like I've set up a whole new system at home with like, I just got lights from Home Depot and like kind of a video capture card and some stuff like that. But anyway, one of the cool things about Panopto, if you mess with it, is that you can actually sort of like, you can still do like the multiple screen capture, which is what my students really like. Um, and because you can sort of have one screen that's like showing like a video of me, but that's mostly useless. And then there's like the, here's the code that they actually need to see. But it's anyway, it's kind of cool. You can still do that at home. Anyway, it's been fun messing around with like different microphones, different kinds of like, um, uh, you know, kind of projectors. Anyway, I figure I'll sort of throw up three different sort of formats. And then I thought, oh, I'll just put up, I'll get in front of my big screen TV and it'll be sort of like I'm in classroom. Uh, anyway, and then I figure I'll send around a quiz and see what people actually like. So I'm kind of curious to see um, see what they say when we get all done. That's great. I love I love that you're having fun right now. That makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was thinking it's one of the things I really find that's it's kind of cool about this time. I mean, I hate to say that, but it kind of sparks all sorts of new creativity just because we're sort of forced to do it. So, um, and it's been interesting to sort of even as there's a lot of anxiety to actually sort of help students also see this as a um, a, a potential for sort of creativity and um, innovation. And so, I, and to sort of figure out how I encourage them to teach me. Um, like, I remember like this background, it was because someone showed up on Zoom with like, you know, like an ocean in the background. I was like, dude, how did you do that? So anyway, I figure every session I have with students now, I'm gonna have a new background every time. So, and I'm having them like actually send me like, hey, what background do you wanna see Jonathan hang out next to? And so, uh, anyway, they're actually sending me uh, anyway, one of the funnest things was, so my daughter did some ridiculous skit about how somehow only rats do stats. And so the next thing I got was this cool gif of like Django, who's like the head rat and Ratatouille with my face pasted on it. So that's, <laughs> that's going to be the next background. That's great. That's great. I, I like I, one thing that you're, you're talking about that we're going to uh, cover in a future continuity community is really that importance of student motivation and yeah. how do you engage students uh, remotely. Uh, so both of those actually, there'll be, there'll be a couple sessions on that. So I encourage people to, to think about that as well, um, to really bring the, bring the human uh, into this experience for people who are, who are sometimes very isolated too. Um, yeah, so I, I want to note what, what Jennifer said here. So uh, to know if students are going to be taking the credit D option um, might be helpful for people to think about how they're assessing. So one thing that hasn't come up yet that I do wanna be sure that we, we say is the opportunity here to ask students how it's going and um, what their plans are and to really think about how they, if appropriate to your course, can help shape the assessment. Um, so you know this is easier in smaller courses that are not necessarily linked to other courses with multiple instructors, so I recognize that. Um, but for those of you who have some, some autonomy to really think about what would work for your students in this course right now. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to them and, and, and start that conversation. Other big questions? So are you, Sydney, uh, the better attendance, I, I think you're, you were talking about Jonathan's um, approach there and copyright concerns, yes, yep. yep. Yeah, so I, I'm, I, I am very interested to see what percent of students choose to um, use the credit D option this semester and for what courses and, and what disciplines. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and it, it's a little unknown, right, for, for all of us. And so I would encourage you to, to think about um, what makes sense for your students and what makes sense for, for um, equality purposes as well, for, for thinking about uh, students' access and what their choices are and, and all of that. Um, might be might be something to really deeply consider for your content and how your course is positioned in students' trajectory um, for their educational process at Yale. Oh. Any other thoughts? 
Uh, so David's asking, any suggestions on high stakes versus low stakes quizzing? Yes, and possible technological challenge students might face. Um, I have suggestions. <laughs> Others might as well. So I'll, I'll say my two cents and, and please raise your hand or, or chime in if you would like to contribute. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of low stakes, frequent low stakes um, assessments. It gives students an opportunity to hear about the way that you give feedback and grade and see what your um, approach is to grading uh, and how you ask questions and what to expect. So if you give frequent uh, opportunities for them to do that, it allows some dynamic right between you and um, others. Um, and I also would say that it lowers the stakes for them to think about uh, easing their anxiety and opportunities for revision or improvement over time, rather than really hanging their hat on one kind of know it or not experience. Yeah, Pilar. I wanted to sort of follow up with this this idea as well that if you've never done online assessments before with your students um, and you may be considering a high stakes one in the future, um, not a bad idea to consider a very low stakes one uh, to give everyone a chance to make sure their technology works. Um, I know this seems um, it could be it could be anything just to you know take a quiz, answer a question about their day, um, upload an assignment. It's just if they've never done it before, it helps them not feel like they're doing it for the first time in this high stakes exam. And um, and so that's that's just a, a suggestion from our side as well. Thank you. Um, I want to note I have I have a note here that I feel obligated to say that there may be it may be the case, and I will follow up with you that um, you don't want to ask your students what their what their um, plans are for credit D, D options. Um, I'm going to check on that because there might be some policy around the appropriateness of asking that in, in different student um, access. So let me check. I will get back in, in the email. And I see Jennifer raising her hand. So I'm going to give her the opportunity to, to talk. Yeah, um, I definitely made sure that when I, I wrote to my students and I said, you are in, under absolutely no obligation to tell me what your plans are for credit D. Um, but I did say that if you are choosing the credit D option, it is possible that we can have a conversation about your specific progress in the course, look at the upcoming assessments and see if you're already at the level where, you know, with one or two more assessments, you would already be at that threshold for getting credit. And therefore we can kind of waive some assessments if that would alleviate things. So definitely want to make sure that it's like clear that the students knew that they don't have to say anything, but that there are more options if they feel comfortable talking about it and want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's it's a hard thing to ask students to um, give information. This is something that that uh, we've been thinking about in uh, getting where students are right now, right? So thinking about what they have access to, what they don't, what their problems are, what their struggles are, what's appropriate to ask them about, right? So that's something that we um, have been really being thoughtful about to respect students' privacy as well as support or uh, where, whatever their situation is to enable them to really be able to participate in the way that they want to, um, because they didn't sign up to be online learners. This is, this is new for everyone. All right, so we've gone over a few different ways that we can either adapt what we've been doing, as well as um, think about maybe some new ways to think about assessment. Um, we have a few more minutes. I'm gonna give you, I wanna give you one, one last poll, and then I'm gonna give you some resources. Uh, and this is really just to ask you, let me be able to get to it here. I would like to know, based on this conversation, are you thinking of adjusting your format? Are you totally unsure? Do you have lots of questions? Um, we would love to follow up. Uh, Poor Boo Center is here. I am here to have these conversations with you. Um, so I really do encourage you to uh, see this as an ongoing conversation. This is really one hour of our time to think about this together. And I recognize that it's going to require more of your time to adjust your assessments. So uh, please reach out. I'm going to tell you a couple more ways in which um, we'll be offering some group uh, conversations to have. Uh, and then we can, can go from there. All right. So 
not everyone's voting, but that's okay. So it looks like everyone I can say has said yes somewhat, which is really what I expected to hear. <laughs> not shocking, right? I'm, I'm glad to see that it's not at least, yes, I'm gonna redo everything, that at least there's some sanity that you're feeling. Um, I'm thankful for that. So I wanna again encourage you to think about taking reasonable steps for what is appropriate. Thanks everyone.